<clears throat> okay, great. And I will be broadcasting now. Hello, and welcome to the Charity and Security Network's webinar on congressional investigations. I'm Andrea Hall, Policy Counsel at Charity and Security Network. And uh, we are joined by two fabulous experts today and are looking forward to a lively program. Uh, first of all, we have Jonathan Weiner. He's a senior counselor at APCO International Advisory Council. He has been the U.S. Special Envoy for Libya, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for International Law Enforcement, and counsel to U.S. Senator John Kerry, as well as a regulatory attorney specializing in national security law and a journalist covering financial and legal matters. He's written and lectured widely on corruption, human rights, counterterrorism, international money laundering, sanctions, financial regulation, and illicit networks. Also with us today is Lee Woloski, a partner at the law firm of Boyce Schiller Flexner. He's a seasoned litigator and crisis manager who has served under the last three U.S. presidents in significant, significant national security positions. He has successfully represented clients in connection with various governmental investigations and sanction matters, including those arising under the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and the President's IEPA authority, and in congressional and national security related investigations. From 2015 to 2017, Lee served as President Obama's Special Envoy for Guantanamo, and in 2016, accorded him the personal rank of ambassador. I will hand the mic to our experts. Hi, uh, welcome. I'm gonna start out and then Lee's gonna pick up. So why are we here? Well, the last department, the one that I call current, we call current Congress here. Can we go to the next slide, please? First slide. Um, there we go. Um, initiated investigations of nonprofits in a way that we hadn't seen in a very long time. A House Natural Resources Committee and its a subcommittee on oversight, which is uh, part of the committee but also has separate authority, wrote to several environmental groups, said, you all are foreign agents because you're hostile to the Trump administration and you're pro-Chinese and you're operating in China. Prove to us uh, that you're not acting on behalf of China. We think you were. It was a heavily footnoted letter. And it asked them to um, provide a wide range of documents, uh, everything related to the communications of the Department of Justice um, relating to the Foreign Agent Registration Act and any uh, information involving the nonprofits with any individual <laughs> associated with any Chinese official, Chinese national, or Chinese uh, business interest. So if you're a nonprofit and operating in China, you're probably going to have contacts with Chinese officials, Chinese nationals, or Chinese business interests. So it was a pretty broad ranging uh, request. Now what it wasn't was a subpoena. It was a letter. And there's a difference as you're going to hear between how one responds to letters and subpoenas. Now because, next slide please. In theory, uh, congressional investigative authority is incredibly broad. It's about as broad as the Constitution is broad. It extends to practically everything, probably everything that's, that's within the Constitution except things that are protected, um, uh, Bill of Rights kind of rights, might be exceptions. You've got Supreme Court um, um, dicta and cases on it. You've got President Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson talking about how important it was more than 100 years ago. And then you've got in particular the Supreme Court's decision in 1927. Congress has got the right to investigate any subject in which investigation could be or would be materialated by the information which the investigation was calculated to elicit. So in theory, you could argue, well, you're not um, thinking about legislation. You couldn't possibly do legislation in the area, but uh, that's really gonna be the margins. Basically, they can do what they want. Next slide, please. If you look at the areas in which Congress has investigated, has contended it has investigative authority, it's hard to imagine what activities you're engaged in which couldn't be incorporated. Um, you could be looking at the IRS's compliance uh, with how it's supposed to treat nonprofits, what Congress wanted its treatment of nonprofits to be. You could be looking at how um, regulations of nonprofits, either at the federal or state level, could be made better. You could be looking at allegations that uh, tax exempt uh, uh, entities were abusing their tax exempt authority for dishonesty, fraud, or, wa or waste, not being as efficient as they should be. Um, and so on. You can just apply each of these things in a nonprofit context and see how broad it is. It includes 
uh, investigating constituent complaints and media critiques. So if a newspaper or a blog or a tweet has said such and such charity is behaving badly, look at how much they spent or what they're doing in China <coughs> or what they're doing in Washington, that might be a sufficient basis for a congressional investigation. Next slide, please. So has this ever happened before this past year? Well, there's actually an incredibly dead-on set of precedents from McCarthy uh, 50, um, 60, 60 uh, five years ago, in which the, a select committee investigated tax exempt foundations to determine if they were using their resources as Congress wanted or for un-American and subversive activities or other purposes not in U.S. interests. They sent letters to every foundation with 10 million or more in assets, concluded they were all behaving well, but then there were people within Congress who said, we don't agree with you, who started up another investigation immediately thereafter and actually concluded the Ford Foundation the Rockefeller Foundation and Carnegie were funding projects at Harvard, Yale, Princeton, University of California, University of Chicago, named in particular, uh, to enable oligarchical collectivism and to support subversion by supporting attacks on the U.S. system. They wound up making specific legislative proposals. Nonprofits should be uh, have to go out of business after 10 or 25 years. Um, if they um, held more than five to ten percent uh, percent of any uh, for-profit business, their tax exemption should be gone. And then, if they did things that we didn't like in terms of supporting socialism, they should uh, lose their uh, fund their funding. Those were actual legislative proposals. They didn't go anywhere. Next slide, please. So, whenever you're thinking about a investigation of a nonprofit, you've got two sides to think about simultaneously. You've got the legal side, and Lee is going to talk in a minute about the legal side uh, and a legal consideration that you have to think about um, at all times. Contempt of Congress, civil criminal referral to justice, in, in legal costs, and the potential of third party civil litigation. You've also got risk of perjury um, uh, as well, potentially. But then at the same time, you've got um, reputation. You don't cooperate enough, or you share information that is embarrassing, you get negative media either way, impact on the mission while you're dealing with this, both domestically and internationally, since many people cross borders now, an impact on your donors. I don't want to be involved with this nonprofit. This nonprofit's got Congress looking at it. I don't need that. Uh, you get the risk of further ideological attacks, and you have operational consequences, is what you're dealing with every day with Congress, you know, wondering whether you can go ahead with this or that activity. So those are things to think about at the same time. Uh, which is one reason why it's important to have a team approach to things. Uh, next slide, please. And to align your objectives so you have a legal strategy and a communication strategy that at all times are reinforcing one another. You want to meet the legal requirements to respond to congressional action and avoid es escalation, but you also really need to uh, um, protect and defend your core values. So one of the things that I recommend at the outset when you're in this kind of situation is to identify all of the different audiences you need to think about at the same time. You've got the people who got you into this mess, Congress, maybe in the press. You've got other stakeholders in your sector. You may have other allies. You've got donors. Uh, and you've got your own employees. And everybody you also interact with. So you need to conceptualize each of those elements and think through a strategy that's going to align those. Um, under the new Congress, um, the, these kinds of investigations from the House are probably going to go away of nonprofits, at least things about cooperating with China against the Trump administration, now the Democrats have taken it. But the Senate um, is certainly uh, has the potential of going after nonprofits that are seen to be uh, opposed to the administration. And even on the House side, you could get uh, ways and means or government oversight wanting to look at the um, nonprofit status of particular um, nonprofits if they're seen as pushing at the margins of what would be uh, legitimate nonprofit activities. In the Senate, you can expect a Judiciary Committee, which has done this from time to time over the years, particularly again in political areas on the Senate side, um, environments and public works, targeting environmental groups on the Senate side. Now if the House is out, there may be people who push them, now uh, train to the Senate and try and get it going there, same thing. Uh, the Health Committee, willing the Education Groups, and the Finance Committee, uh, almost anybody. In the case of the Senate, it's going to tend to be driven by headlines 
or by uh, special interest groups opposed to your mission. In practice, how does the investigative process work? Turning it over to Lou. We've both done with it, but I'll tell you something. I was involved in investigation relatively recently, and when I was, the first person I turned to was Lee Wolosky, one attorney for you. <laughs> Thank you, Jonathan. That's very kind to say. Um, it's also true. I think, I think, um, I think uh, you know, to, to sort of reinforce uh, as we move forward in the slide presentation, one of Jonathan's core points. Um, okay, so, <laughs> all right, so, so let, let's, um, okay, is that, is that where we're settling on the slides right there? Yeah, that's, that's where we should be. Okay, good. Um, so I'll try to go through some of the investigative process uh, and how it works in, um, yeah, sort of a layman's sense uh, than possible. Um, the, uh, the, the process um, it typically begins with a document request, uh, which uh, unlike a subpoena does not carry, um, you know, uh, it's not a form of compulsory process, meaning that um, uh, there's, um, there's no legal force really behind it. Um, when you receive a document request from um, from a congressional committee, though, uh, uh, the best thing to do is to uh, uh, enter into a negotiation uh, regarding the request rather than simply say blowing it off, uh, which is n never a good idea. Um, but typically, what what your lawyer can do or what what you can do is pick up the phone and call the committee staff. Uh, and try to narrow the scope of uh, what typically are very expansive document requests um, that uh, ask for you, you to produce, uh, you know, very uh, broad categories and sometimes very vague categories of, of documents. You know, give us everything that you have regarding all of your grant making or, or grant receipt. Um, and you know the purpose of this negotiation is really twofold, and sort of it's both to um, limit the burden on you as you go about trying to comply with a congressional inquiry, and also, frankly, it's um, it's to enable the committee to uh, it's for you to learn uh, about what the committee is really interested in, uh, and ultimately to limit the burden on the committee uh, in terms of um, you know the types of documents that uh, that they might actually be interested in receiving. Um, it, is, um, it is also typically the case that after, you know, after you receive or in connection with your receipt of a document request, uh, they ask uh, for interviews. I would call them interviews instead of depositions uh, where you go in and, um, uh, and you know, you, you will, you know, sit and answer questions typically based on the documents that have been produced uh, typically with a uh, reporter there who's recording or transcribing uh, you know what you say questions that are asked and the answers that are given um, you can go to the next slide so uh, you know th this this what happens when um, when you don't want to give up certain documents or when uh, the committee is uh, asking for documents that don't exist, but they don't believe that they don't exist. Uh, and uh, you're basically at an impasse of some sort with res res respect to turning over something to the committee that they want that either you don't have uh, or you don't want to provide to them. Um, then, then the committee, depending on which committee it is and what the rules are at the time, uh, can, uh, can issue a subpoena uh, which um, does create a legal obligation to respond uh, to the committee. Uh, and subpoenas um, uh, can cover, doc cover, could cover documents or they can cover testimony, meaning you have to go in and um, submit to an interview, not because you're choosing to, but because you have to under, under force of law. Um, you know, Sometimes people don't respond to congressional subpoenas, and uh, um, you know, then if that happens. Uh, theoretically, you can be held in contempt of Congress. Um, and what does that mean? I mean, I think we're going to get to that on the next on the next slide. But you know, generally, um, you can be held in contempt, which is not a good thing, and generally something to avoid. 
uh, the, the, the truth and sort of the practical, you can go to the next slide. Uh, aside from fines being issued and things of that sort, you know, contempt is, um, uh, is not something that is typically easily enforced. Uh, and Jonathan, I think, can speak to that through some of the case studies that he's been personally involved in, uh, which are on this slide. But, you know, the, 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 the bottom line of it is, is that Congress doesn't have an enforcement arm, you know, like the Department of Justice has the FBI, which can go in and seize documents or servers, uh, or the U.S. Mar US Marshal Service, which could um, seize property and things of that sort. Um, uh, but there is, you know, as this slide points out, there is a lot of, you know, um, uh, unsettled law on the sort of issue of enforcing a congressional subpoena and enforcing a contempt citation. Uh, typically, you know, uh, that can be, you know, you do have to go to the courts to, um, uh, to enforce in some cases. Uh, but Jonathan, do you want to speak to some of these case studies sure. that you were personally involved in and sort yeah. of the limitations of contempt of Congress? Sure. In 1992, when I was staffing Senator Kerry on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, we were investigating the collapse of a big bank called the Bank of Commerce and Credit International, which is the biggest bank failure uh, up to that time, sometimes known as the Bank of, of Crooks and Criminals, Inc., because it did so much uh, corrupt activity. Uh, Henry Kissinger had been a um, one of the consultants that BCCI uh, consulted with as it was trying to manage the fallout of the, its problems in Washington. And the Senate Foreign Relations Committee had wanted Kissinger's client list years before because of concerns that he'd been doing things on behalf of the uh, People's Republic of China. So I put together a, a, a list of requests uh, by subpoena for BCCI. And the Senate Foreign Relations Committee voted in support of all of them, included um, Henry Kissinger's client list. Now, part of that was the, uh, the uh, history uh, that had gone before when he had basically refused to provide it to an earlier Congress. So he hired Lloyd Cutler, who had been uh, Bill Clinton's first uh, 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 White House counsel soon thereafter, and the main partner and it was then Wilma Cutler and Pickering. And Lloyd came in with John Bellinger, who later became State Department legal advisor, and said, we'll give you every document that you want related to BCCI, every single one. We're not going to withhold anything, but uh, you can drag us into court and take it all the way to the Supreme Court before you're going to get Henry Kissinger's client list. That's abuse. That's gross abuse, and you know it's gross abuse. And he went on a 10 or 15 minute array, and I listened politely. And um, he then gave us the documents, and he was in effect daring us to go back and get the whole Senate, which he would have per lobbied personally, both Kissinger and Cutler, to get that client list. And he figured if he, if he gave us what we were entitled to, we would go away. And that's exactly what happened. We got all of the material related to BCPI. It's in a congressional report, which he then sought to suppress later, that uh, the section of the report related to that, but that was okay. But we let the rest of it go. So it was a classic, um, um, very experienced Washington lawyer making a decision about what you give the committee and where you draw the line assuming that we would never be able to enforce a request that really went beyond the scope of the investigation. Now, a different version of that happened this past year with Fusion GPS in connection with the Trump-Russia investigation and the House of Representatives. It was the same kind of issue. The House of Representatives under Daryl Nunes asked Glenn Simpson and his uh, Fusion GPS for all their client records, not records relating to Trump-Russia, not records relating to Christopher Steele, but absolutely everything. And when Fusion said no and, and took the Fifth Amendment, among other things, they then went to their bank and, and tried subpoenaing all of the records from the bank. And the bank was ready to give it up because they didn't have a stake in it. So Fusion was in a situation where it was going into federal court on the basis of the Bank Secrecy Act, banking confidentiality, to try and deny Congress uh, the right to this. And in the end, it was negotiated up. You would give us absolutely everything relating to your work with Christopher Steele, your work relating to Trump, Russia, we won't get your other clients' information, which is what they were trying to protect. So it was the same principle. Uh, the question is, what's the legitimate scope and what's going to be too hard to defend that you might lose? And that's how it got negotiated out. Back to Lee. Thanks, Jonathan. You can go to the next slide, please. Um, this is a really important slide. Uh, 
even though Congress has unsettled enforcement priorities, um, it is the case that they can refer criminal cases to the Department of Justice. Uh, and um, sort of the, the basic rule is that in dealing with Congress, you can uh, say, you know, as Jonathan was just uh, giving, stating through his examples, you can basically say we're not going to produce certain documents to you. Um, uh, but what you can't do is lie. So uh, if you lie, uh, if, you, if you lie or make false statements, um, lying being given, given, giving false testimony under oath and giving false statements even in an unsworn context to, say, the staff uh, that is not under oath, uh, uh, you can be subject to criminal prosecution. Um, and, uh, uh, and that obviously can be very serious uh, and is something to be avoided at all costs. Um, last point there is that, you know, Congress hasn't accepted um, uh, sort of the notion that attorney-client communications are privileged. Um, you know, certainly in dealing with the Congress, um, lawyers do on behalf of their clients routinely take the position that they're not going to disclose protected attorney-client communications. Uh, and um, this is somewhat of an unsettled area in the law, uh, but, um, uh, but, you know, as the slide points out, uh, no one has ever been um, sort of subjected to contempt for not turning over uh, attorney-client material. Next slide. Um, here too, again, you know, there are differences in the context of dealing with other types of privileges, work product and other spousal privilege and common law defenses that prohibit or limit discovery in the civil litigation context. On the one hand, from dealing with Congress, on the, on the other hand, the rules are different. Uh, and, um, uh, and that's just something to keep to, for litigators in particular to, to keep in mind. Uh, the same types of limitations, privileges, and defenses that apply in a civil lit litigation context may not apply uh, in respond responding to congressional investigations. Uh, last point on this slide is, is quite, quite important, which is that, you know, um, there is no such thing as, as a fair hearing in Congress. The, the hearing is whatever, the hearing or the process is really what the Congress determines it to be. Uh, so you don't have the right to cross-examination, for example. Uh, and you don't really have a right on deadlines or formats of hearings or inquiries. Uh, scope of questioning, time, even as you saw in the Kavanaugh hearing, who's going to do the questioning and things of that sort. Uh, all of that, you know, unlike in a civil litigation context where you are sort of bound and constrained by the rules of civil procedure and the Constitution, um, in congressional inquiries, uh, there is a lot more fluidity. Uh, and there is, um, you know, very you know, almost complete, subject to constitutional limitations, discretion on the part of uh, committee chairman and staff as to how they conduct their investigations. Next slide. Um, is this where I'm toggling back to you, Jonathan, or not yet? Sure. I'm happy to, to take this over. Okay. If you think about the controversies within the Trump administration, Betsy DeVos, for example, Department of Education, um, and the way in which he's approached um, um, private schools versus public schools and funding, you can imagine um, the investigations that might be undertaken. If her DHS, it's going to be family separations. Um, commerce, there are questions uh, about the cabinet, the secretary, and some of his ethics issues. Same with EPA and Interior. Um, Justice Department's pretty obvious, it's getting litigated, the court of public opinion every day, and veterans issues are perennial. So I personally think that there will be investigations in all of these areas of the administration. I don't see the House Democrats particularly going after nonprofits, except as driven by an abuse, an alleged abuse of a nonprofit, fraud, waste, and abuse kind of thing. Um, somebody uh, ostensibly spending too much money or stealing money or not doing what they're supposed to be doing with their money, in which the uh, Congressional Committee is trying to make a point about one of those things. By contrast, the kind of investigations you saw in the House, as I mentioned earlier, could move over to the Senate now, as the same people pushing those areas of inquiry before House side now have to turn Senate side uh, to get those issues ventilated. And there you may see um, uh, activists with contrary agendas to your nonprofits 
uh, uh, sector uh, pushing in back of um, those inquiries. One of the dirty little secrets, and maybe it isn't um, a secret, and maybe it's not little, but it is kind of dirty, that I uh, experienced with shock when I first began working for the Congress 33 years ago, is how many of the bills, the laws that um, were introduced were drafted for in the first instance by the private sector. And what then um, came as an additional shock was when I realized that investigative efforts, congressional inquiries to committees, all of that too was often directed first by the private sector. Now it's not just private sector, it's an entire range of interest groups, some of which may be um, ostensibly nonprofits themselves. So in this complex environment, almost anybody can stimulate some member of Congress to do almost anything, making the range of things that come up um, pretty broad. Uh, James O'Keefe is a perfect example. When he is doing his efforts to um, get incriminatory tape, on Planned Parenthood or ACORN or NPR or Society Institute, it is not just for the purpose of embarrassing or stimulating an IRS inquiry. It is most fundamentally with the intention of congressional uh, investigations in mind. And it's important to be thinking about your organization always, Chroma, if this was publicized or twisted, uh, what could be done to us point of view? And keeping that as part of your role, a little paranoia in Washington these days is probably um, a, a useful thing. So let's go to the next slide after the how likely slide. So let's assume that Congress now has called, despite your best efforts, despite all the work you've undertaken to stay clean and to do the right thing. Um, you've got two different tasks at the same time to be thinking about. You've got what you're doing internally and you're going to be doing what you're going to be doing externally. And I would emphasize limiting the public response initially. Um, you don't want to do something in the first days, which you're going to regret a week or two weeks or a month later. You want to assemble a core team that incorporates government relations, public relations, and give them each work to do and then to come back to some kind of internal committee. And you want somebody in charge. I have seen IT people um, off doing one thing, government relations, public relations, and legal, not sufficiently integrated and to create massive problems with a company. Cyber being a good example, you have a cyber attack. The IT people say, don't tell anybody. We're gonna figure out what's going on. That can turn out to be the wrong strategy for public relations, turn out to be the wrong strategy for customer relations, turn out to be the wrong strategy in legal and regulatory terms, um, and the wrong strategy for Congress. So knitting everybody together early is really important. This is why, from the beginning, I think it's really critical to figure out what you're going to need by way of legal counsel, based on the, the scale of what you're facing, whether you think it's a sufficient magnitude or risk, and a crisis communications counsel, decide whether your existing congressional relations efforts are sufficient or you need more, and prepare a holding statement at the front end, which is your initial story, not to put out proactively. That's a decision. Sometimes you will, mostly you won't. But in any case, uh, 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 to manage a situation for when media inquiries come, um, staff, inquiries from staff, inquiries from donors, or inquiries from the general public. Next slide, please. So looking at the communications checklist, undertake scenario planning. Assess the risk of the organization and what your options are for countering. Map your stakeholders internally and externally. Everybody who's inside your organization who could be affected and their different concerns. They're not always lined up. You're gonna want them to line up, but initially they may not be. Particularly if you're an international company, it becomes even more complicated. If you're in multi-states, it can be complicated. Uh, stakeholder mapping externally. Um, who are your friends, who are your enemies, who's neutral, who's relevant to the governments, federal and state, other governments, international organizations, traditional print, broadcast online, social media, and so on, think tanks, activists, it can be a quite a complex environment. You ought to think about who's going to matter to you. Develop your initial communications plan, which certainly includes all source media monitor, monitoring and influencer mapping. Who is driving the dialogue? Who could drive the dialogue? The person driving the dialogue may be James O'Keefe. Uh, it may be a member of Congress who's going to be in their bunch. Uh, uh, it could be um, Rachel Maddow or um, uh, Sean Hannity, but you want to know who's driving it and who's driving that. And you want to define a spokesperson and a method to communicate. 
because if you don't do that, you can wind up having anybody in the, in the organization um, called on suddenly to make a comment, and the uncoordinated comments can potentially create complications for you. So that's the communication side. Uh, next checklist, uh, next slide, please, over you. Lee, you're on mute. Well, we'll wait a moment for Lee to come back. Um, it's temporarily frozen, so uh, there he is. Now we just have to have him not on mute. You got me now? We got you, Lee, thank you. Okay. Okay, first and foremost, whenever you get any type of request for documents from a judicial or congressional body, the first thing you do is you send out a notice to your organization advising all uh, individuals who may have relevant documents to preserve those documents and to suspend any sort of automatic, um, you know, auto deletion procedures that may be in place. Uh, whether they're local or remote in the cloud or whatever it is, you got to hold on to all documents, uh, hard copy or electronic, because um, you can find yourself in a jam if you receive an information request or a subpoena and you later say, well, I don't have those documents because they were destroyed. Um, second point is, and this isn't only in the context of uh, investigations, uh, but um, uh, but, but more generally, um, it is important to exercise care in written electronic communications. Um, uh, as we all know, sometimes those communications can be misconstrued, misinterpreted, uh, and you just have to be really clear and careful about what you were saying in writing uh, because uh, months or years later, uh, it can pop up in the hands of a congressional investigator uh, and be, um, uh, if it is an ambiguous email, um, you know, distorted in a way that, um, that you don't like. Um, uh, also, a, you know, a common sense, common sense point is that when you are communicating about legal issues, uh, you, you know, should not automatically hit reply to all, you should not automatically use group email distributions. Uh, but you should limit those communications to as small of a circle as possible uh, if they are in writing, uh, and so too with oral communications. Um, uh, this is, is a practical matter to protect the confidenti confidentially, confidentiality of the information, but also to protect the legal privilege that um, uh, you, you or your organization may wish to assert later in order to prevent the content of those communications from being disclosed to investigators. Um, uh, here too, you know, on external communications, it's important, as Jonathan was saying, when you have your team, you have to put in place procedures to make sure that the team is uh, operating on an integrated basis, uh, and that there's sign off uh, on the part of all relevant portions of the team uh, before anything um, is issued publicly, that includes you know, the lawyers too, who are advising you uh, uh, on the investigation. Um, uh, even, you know, even, you know, with respect to document collection, when you're collecting documents, that is something that, you know, most cases outside lawyers will, will handle. Uh, in some cases, they will give you guidance as to, um, you know, what types of documents to collect and how, and then you do it yourself. But in any, in any event, that is something that you should work on with, with lawyers, whether it's being performed, you know, sort of manually and, and mechanically by the outside firm or just really at their direction. Um, what else? Uh, yeah, and then the last point, you know, you, you should feel you know, you should feel free in speaking in a privileged setting, in other words, with lawyers uh, about ways to minimize um, risks and implement best practices. The time to, you know, have those types of discussions and the context in which to have them is with, um, you know, is in a privileged setting with lawyers uh, and not, um, not in a context that uh, may require you or your organization to disclose the content of those communications uh, if lawyers are not 
uh, present or, or coolers are not exclusively present in a way that maintains the privilege. Uh, next slide. Yeah, I want to make one point on this really uh, checklist, if I could. Yep. Um, I was in, I've been involved in a matter, counseling somebody in a matter that involved a charity and a private sector company that had worked with the charity in which there was extensive media investigations and some follow-up congressional interest. It wound up not going anywhere in the end, but it was a tremendous concern at the time, in which people from the charity and people from the company got together and consulted with one another on the facts without counsel presence. And when I found out about it, um, I was not happy. I had uh, been advising the organization, not the charity. And I said, uh, don't do that without counsel present, even with counsel present. You really don't want to be in a situation where somebody could say that you guys are uh, coordinating your stories uh, to get a story that's mutually acceptable to both rather than um, um, getting the facts. And they said, well, of course, that's what we're doing. Yes, we don't want to be embarrassed by having different sets of facts. So we're trying to make sure that our, our facts are all lined up. <laughs> and I said, well, you can tell that story to Congress or the FBI uh, later on. Um, and uh, at that point, I was essentially in shutdown communications. And the charity, uh, which I was not representing, was pretty unhappy about it. They felt exposed because they hadn't finished um, getting their story straight uh, with the entity that I was representing. Um, if you're going to have to have those kinds of conversations at all, and needless to say, I, I think coordinating the story, which could be seen as coming up with a story that's um, where one or the other is shaded the truth, um, and which you have a very minimal embarrassing thing, if you're going to do something like that, you certainly ought to talk to the lawyers ahead of time and consider what information can be exchanged to lawyers as part of a joint defense or some kind of agreement, rather than have people who could be called as witnesses uh, doing that work. So and it's remarkable what people will do when they think, oh, this is just a communications problem. We're just talking communications here. We're not in litigation. This is just about what we're going to say to the press. Uh, no, that's legal. It's not just communications. Next slide. I'll leave it back to you. Um, thanks, Jonathan. Uh, so, um, you know, these are some sort of common sense communications points. You know, one, one thing that I would want to uh, highlight is, um, you know, the sort of the middle point under tactical, uh, which is that, you know, and this is communications advice more than legal, uh, it, it definitely is helpful um, when you're in a crisis to uh, have yeah, third, what, what you know, communications professionals would call third-party validators have uh, individuals with credibility in the media lined up uh, to basically do your bidding for you, to defend you against accusations, some of which may be partisan in nature, that are coming out of um, uh, of the Congress or wherever. Uh, that is, uh, in my experience, one of the uh, critical ways to sort of, you know, neutralize attacks is by having. Um, you know, voices that have credibility, uh, but which are independent. In other words, they're not your organization and they're not your lawyers um, making the case for you uh, and perhaps restoring some measure of rationality to sort of a partisan, frenzied uh, media environment. Um, likewise, very important to, to get your, get your facts uh, lined up so that you can present your best facts to the media. That's sort of the next point there. Um, that doesn't mean making up facts. It means finding the best facts, uh, you know, within within your narrative, uh, to make sure that they are they are not lost in the context of broader reporting. Uh, strategic. I think Jonathan made this point previously. Uh, what is key uh, to navigating any uh, congressional investigation that does have a high profile, that may have a high pro public profile, is an early start to building up your team. Uh, you can't be building up your team while you're in the middle of a crisis and you're getting incessant media inquiries about something that the Congress or a member of Congress may have said or done. You really need to get that done early on. You need to have your, you know, your, your internal uh, individuals lined up to avoid the multiple voice problem uh, that's highlighted in this slide. You need to have your external team uh, lined up and your external team uh, may include lawyers, it may include 
um, external public relations professionals. Uh, and you know, you need to figure out who's doing what, who's responsible for what, and how everyone else is, how, how the team is gonna work together uh, to make sure that there is a coordinated uh, and thought through response. Next slide, please. That's us. And that's, and that's it, that's us. That's I want to make one last comment on the, on the last slide, um, which is the technical term of art we sometimes use on the third party validators is uh, Jedi yeah, Knights. Yeah. You want to have no. Jedi Knights out there as part of your effort that are coming from different directions. So the evil empire or whatever it is that's attacking has got people attacking them in different directions. The trouble with being in a crisis is often you get attacked in multiple directions. You think you've got one uh, fire put out that's hitting you from another place, which goes back to the need for coordinated coordination of the response across the board. But if you can build out validators, uh, that's really helpful. Thank you, Jonathan and Lee. And thank you for the Star Wars analogy. I, I appreciate that. Um, we are looking for questions from participants. If you scroll, if you drag your cursor, um, if you're on a laptop or desktop, you can drag your cursor down to the bottom of your screen. You'll see an icon that says Q&A. And if you click on that, it gives you a place to type your question. In the meantime, I do have a question for our panelists, and that is, um, could you please explain the similarities and differences between an oversight investigation of the entire nonprofit sector versus one that targets specific organizations or types of organizations? And how might the response from nonprofits differ in those two scenarios? Jonathan? Sure. Well, if, you're in, if your organization is being targeted, there's going to be a reason. You're going to have gotten somebody to target you for a reason, whether uh, you knew it or not. Many, many years ago, I did the, um, the Dubai Port World um, CFIUS matter, and it became a giant congressional issue across the board after we had successfully gotten the CFIUS through. And it turned out that the reason we got uh, turned on was because a particular a company wanted the Port of Florida and had a relationship with Chuck Schumer. And so the company that wanted the Port of Florida uh, uh, put together a, a presentation and shined the spotlight on us to get Schumer into action and then built it from there. So we had a particular problem with a particular company and that generated the whole thing. So uh, the, the, the real difference is if it's, a, if it's an industry-wide um, generic sectoral thing. You're going to have trade associations and sectoral battles with sectoral interest in favor and sectoral interests against. And the investigative aspects are likely to be somewhat muted. The policy issues come to dominate. You'll have different views on policy. People may highlight particular practices in an effort to gain some advantage, but it's less likely to be intimate and personal. It's less likely to affect um, uh, the individual entity in the same kind of life or death way. It could possibly affect the sector that way, but interests wind up one way or another defending themselves uh, moderately well. Somebody may have a, a win, a partial win, and somebody else a partial loss, but it tends not to be as much of an existential threat. If occasionally it's the whole industry, I think of the whole, whole life, for example, um, and it's tax bill, uh, they'll activate the people who care about them from a geographic basis. Um, and that's another point about as you really get your allies. Think geography. Members of Congress on the House side uh, represent particular districts. Think about who in there is in their district they're going to care about, because that can have a real difference in shaping um, who you're, uh, what an antagonist might do, what a protagonist might do. When you've got uh, the person who's stimulating this and back you, your real enemy, whoever it is, and they're in the district of a member or contribute a bunch of money to a member, you can then think about that as part of your counter strategy. Um, so it, I think it's a very different thing. When, when you're being targeted in particular, uh, it, it, it's a much dicier situation. Now, the one that gave rise to the seminar, in the summer, there were four environmental groups. So it was a mixture of sector um, and individual. But from, that, from the point of view of, of that query, for those four entities, it was as if it was just targeting them, each of them, because each one was potentially at risk depending on what information they provided. And the four could become one if one of them was seen as more vulnerable than the others. So you have to assess what what makes you an attractive target. How can you make yourself uh, less attractive to whoever the predator is? Lee, did you want to add anything to that? No, I think that's exactly spot on. 
So we have two additional questions that came in real quick. Um, we've had a couple of people ask about whether they can get a copy of the slides afterwards, and yes, uh, we will have the slides available, and we will also post the recording on our website, so you can go back and look at it. Um, the other question we had came in says, what legal powers, if at all, does the minority party in Congress have to check what it perceives to be an abusive investigation? Uh, I will let the former congressional staffer on this uh, Zoom meeting respond. It, it's, it's, the answer to that is actually political, not legal. Um, it depends on the uh, rules adopted by that House in that Congress. When I served in Congress, for the most part, uh, on the, in the House of Representatives, a majority chairman could, on his own, or with his, or his or her committee, uh, issue subpoenas, and the rights of the minority did not matter at all. By contrast, on the Senate side, it was typical practice to have minority and majority chairs sign off. And then if there was a fight, uh, it would have to be a majority of the committee. So if it wasn't a fight, the sign off of the uh, chairman and the ranking member would usually do it, and in practice it usually did it, but then you could, would, could it would require a majority, uh, as we did with Kissinger, for example. The rules have changed over the years, and these days, for the most part, uh, subpoenas are issued by chairs without further vote of the committee, and uh, the minorities um, are more or less ignored. That's been particularly true in the House, but it's largely prevailed in the Senate, with some exceptions. Formal subpoenas, for example, out of the Finance Committee, uh, which Chuck Grassley's committee have required sign-off by Diane Feinstein as well. The Senate Intelligence Committee uh, works the same way. So it's really a committee by committee uh, 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 practice, and it goes to the rules of the committee. That said, uh, a minority, even without legal authority, can have substantial political impact in curtailing the damage that's being done to an entity. If you can articulate um, morals-based, uh, values-based reasons uh, why the behavior of the majority was improper and should not be um, supported by the Congress. Finally, when it comes to contempt, a contempt has to be voted on and supported by a majority of the, of the body of the House uh, that's issued the contempt um, citation. So their um, minorities can't veto, but they can have a, a substantial impact. And uh, that makes contempt a very, very high bar for that reason. We do not have any more questions coming in, so I would like to give uh, Jonathan and Lee a chance to, um, if they would like, to just offer any concluding thoughts. Yeah, my concluding thought would be, from time to time, uh, as a nonprofit, convene internally to look at your environmental risk factors, not just from, from Congress, but from all your constituencies as to where you have a potential risk of negative publicity or anything that could impair your mission based on factual developments and to see if there are risk mitigation things that you can put into play ahead of that. It may be difficult to red team yourself to look for vulnerabilities or risks. It's not necessarily a pleasant process. And it's not something that you really want to do and then have leak out. So it's something that you want to do quietly. But it's worth doing from time to time just as you're doing your positive plan uh, because things can be anticipated um, uh, sometimes, and anticipating it can uh, put you ahead of it if you don't actually experience the risk. Just two points. Uh, the first, um, and sort of follow on to what Jonathan just said, is uh, I think it's important uh, in, in the normal course of risk mitigation and management to always be mindful of how your um, sort of how your documents and how sort of the results of what you might be forced to turn over in a congressional investigation uh, will look in the record of an investigation. Um, you know, as lawyers, uh, Jonathan and I spent a lot of our time looking at the record of a case or an investigation uh, after it is created uh, and without any regard whatsoever to what it's gonna look like if it falls into the hands uh, of an investigative body or the media. So the way you mitigate that risk is in the normal sort of life cycle organization, have outside experts come in, lawyers come in, and do an assessment of how you communicate um, uh, with each other uh, externally uh, so that you have a sense if you ever do have to respond to a subpoena or an information request uh, 
you get a sense of um, you know what that would look like in the record of an investigation. Uh, second point is just that you know, if you do get um, uh, a letter from Congress uh, or uh, a subpoena, um, go out and get counsel because generally congressional investigations uh, can be managed, uh, you know, not without you know in some cases reputational risk, uh, but they can be managed. Uh, in, in part because, you know, um, in, in many ways there's no sanction. I mean, there's just sort of investigation, but there's no sanction generally unless you willfully violate uh, the rules of the investigation. So it's not like someone's going to come generally and put you in jail. It's not like someone is going to come and, you know, uh, enter a large judgment against your organization, which is going to put it out of business generally. So what you want to do is go out and get competent legal advice to manage the investigation uh, so that you you don't mess it up uh, and that's really uh, that's really my 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 last bit of, uh, of advice right. I'm gonna throw in one more thing if you can figure out how to get everybody in your organization not to write stupid emails that not to put your write down into something in an email or even a text message that they're gonna regret later uh, that's a valuable thing for all kinds of reasons not just congressional investigations Yes, and that, that, that's really a, a more direct statement of my first point. <laughs> you know, uh, you, you really want to, you know, have, before there is an investigation, you want to comment, you, you want to do an analysis of how people are using email, how people are communicating with each other, both inside the organization and outside the organization. So that again, you know, if there is a, um, uh, an investigation and you have to sort of count that there might be one day, uh, you know, you, you'll see how it, how it all looks, you know, when it's in the hands of a congressional committee uh, or, or the media. Thank you so much, both Jonathan and Lee, for a fantastic presentation. Um, and again, look on our website towards the end of the week. We should have things, uh, the recording and the slides posted. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.